Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. My name is Taylor and I'm going through all the books that I read in the month of February. This was a very good reading month for me. Um, in the past couple of months I've been in kind of a reading slump, been pulling my way up out of that, and I ended up reading about like 15 books, so that's really good, um, especially because February is the shortest month of the year. And not only did I read a lot of books, it was a really good reading month. I really highly enjoyed a ton of the books I read because I've been trying it to DNF books that I don't really care for. Um, I don't do star ratings anymore because I am in the process of writing a book. I would love to be a published author someday. I just don't want to um, put that kind of ranking out in the world, just rather share books that I recommend. I participated in thriller -thon this month, that was really fun. Um, there might be a vlog coming up. I did accidentally, like, some of the footage got corrupted, so depending on whether or not I can fix that is if that vlog will go up or not. And then I also read a lot of books for the Goodreads 2019 Best of Horror. I'm trying to read the top 20 books in that and um, it's going a little bit uh, longer than I expected because some of them are definitely not as much my cup of tea as others. This is gonna be a bit of a lengthy video, so grab a snack, buckle in, let's get on with the reviews. The first book I read this month was Violet by Scott Thomas. This is a book about a mother and her daughter, and after tragedy strikes their family, they decide to spend an entire summer at the lake house that the mother character she grew up as as a child. They're trying to bond together, kind of pick up the pieces after a trauma. Also discover a little bit of a mystery surrounding the mother's childhood imaginary friend starts becoming the daughter's imaginary best friend, and there might be something a little more ghostly at play than just a wild imagination. This was a really good book. I felt like it dealt with how people and how children kind of absorb trauma and try and cope with it on their own. I thought that was done really well. I thought there were a lot of great discussions about grief and how sometimes you can feel like the way that you're processing grief isn't the right way to process grief. I actually tended to like the second half of this book better than the first half. It is very slow to start off with and the writing in this book is very very detailed. A lot of this first part of the book had to deal with the mother really wants to rebuild this cabin because it was her father is dead and it's her cabin now and she feels in some way she can rebuild her life by rebuilding this cabin, by doing some renovation in this cabin. All of it is described. <laughs> so there are very lengthy paragraphs and even whole chapters of this book where nothing really happens except for home renovation and description of that home renovation. So, but if you don't mind maybe skimming over some of those sections or if you don't mind a ton of description, I think it's definitely worth it to get to the end part of the book where you kind of figure out the ghostly mystery of what is happening at the cabin. The next book that I read in February was The Twisted Ones by T. King Fisher. This is a library book, so sorry about the shine, but this is another one that was Goodreads 2019 um, top 20 books. I enjoyed this one. I definitely thought that I wasn't going to enjoy it going in. It didn't really seem like my kind of book. It's described as folkloric horror, and after reading Violet, I kind of wanted something that was more fast paced and Maybe this is just my preconceived notions, but I feel like folkloric horror tends to be slower. I ended up picking this up on audiobook, and I think that was a really good decision for me. There is definitely a lot of prose in here that's kind of repeated over and over again um, as a sort of internal monologue that definitely takes on a creepier aspect if you're hearing it as opposed to just kind of reading it, because I feel like there was one page where I'm sure it would have been like half of the page was the same sentence and I feel like as a reader you kind of skip over it because you know it's the same sentence but having to listen to it again and again and again really heightened the creep factor so this was a really good one I feel like to read on audiobook. The main character I believe her name is Mouse. I know that's not her real name but I believe she's only referred to as her nickname and that's what her family calls her so she's a grown woman she's in between editing jobs and she moves to a cabin in the middle of the woods. I was apparently feeling some sort of theme at the beginning of this month and she moves to her grandmother's cabin to clear it out. Her grandmother has passed away and her father offers Mouse a big cut of what they'll make if they sell the cabin if she goes and clears it out because her grandma's a little bit of a hoarder. She discovers a creepy journal that her step-grandfather wrote about his time at the cabin and some weird things going on and these weird things start happening to her. There's like folklore tales, this folk folkloric horror, and 
the stories start to become real and she realizes that she's a part of it. T. Kingfisher writes dogs incredibly well. There's a dog character in here that was very endearing. I feel like dog owners will really resonate with that. The dog kind of helps out and also is a little bit of liability in terms of the monsters that are faced in this and that's very relatable as someone who has a very floofy 50-ish pound lap dog. Um, I feel like he would try and help out but make things worse and that's a little bit what the dog in here kind of acts like. So that was really endearing um, and it was just a really well done audiobook. It was a single narration audiobook but I thought that the character voices were done really well that you could distinguish between everyone and it really enhanced the creep factor. This next book is one of my favorite books that I read this month and that was A Full Throttle by Joe Hill which surprised me for a number of reasons because number one it's a short story collection. I'm not really the biggest fan of short story collections as a whole. Um, I tend to like longer fiction and also first story in this has to deal with a motorcycle gang and just like a culture that I'm not really interested in I guess. I definitely think it was good that it was a short story because I definitely couldn't read a full-length novel about that biker gang and that one was also co-written with Stephen King who is Joe Hill's father. I thought it was one of the weakest stories so I thought it was kind of interesting that it was the title of the short story collection as well as the first short story presented but um, other than that I would say for the most part this was really good. Now for my horror fans out there who is, are very familiar with Joe Hill as a horror writer, I would say this collection actually tends to be more of his dark fantasy stuff rather than horror. There are a lot of these, I wasn't scared by a lot of these much as um, they were really impactful. There was one I believe called Late Returns in particular that was very sweet and touching and heartwarming. Um, something that I wasn't expecting going into a horror short stories. There's another one, I believe it's called Fawn, and that really just reminds me of like a darker Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe story, so that's very fantasy based. But there are some true horror short stories in here, like Dark Carousel feels very Ray Bradbury-esque, and also they have Twittering from the Circus of the Dead that was written all in tweets, which was very, really well done. Overall, really good. I think this is my favorite short story collection by Joe Hill. He's written I believe only one other one that was Strange Weather. I think these stories are less cohesive than Strange Weather but it really showcases Joe Hill as a versatile author. He's really good at writing horror. Um, I mean I would argue that he's better at writing horror than Stephen King but he's also really good at writing darker fantasy stories as well. So while I'm hoping that Joe Hill's next release is going to be a full-length novel rather than a short story collection, I really enjoyed this. Um, I got it from Barnes & Noble. It's a signed copy. So that's really cool as well um, because he's quickly becoming one of my favorite authors and if you are like me and you don't really enjoy short story collections, don't worry. He has a ton of full-length novels that I absolutely adore, Nisferatu being one of my favorites. The next book I read really on a whim because I've really been getting into Scribd and discovered that they had this whole entire series on Scribd, which is awesome and that is the Redwall series. The audiobooks are full cast narration. This is definitely middle grade fantasy. It's a very long sprawling series about woodlanders. I would say, you know, very Tolkien-esque, um, but definitely for younger readers. I believe like the AR reading level for these books is about fourth to fifth grade. So if you're looking for an audiobook suggestion for a child, loves fantasy, loves books about animals, the Redwall series are amazing. Brian Jakes narrates them and just the cast of characters is just so wonderful. Um, it really adds a lot to the story. I loved these books as a kid. They really helped me fall in love with fantasy, fall in love with the reading. It's really fun to sit down and listen to an audiobook that just felt like stories being told. I think high fantasy really excels in the spoken word format just because the nature of the stories themselves kind of feel like they are like campfire stories or epic stories told from generation to generation. So every single one of them's on script. Full cast audiobooks. Excellently done quality. Highly recommend these if you're looking for kind of like a wholesome little break in between heavier reads or if you're just looking for a really cute little middle grade series to pick up. And then the next book I read was like 
the polar opposite from that middle grade book, and that was American Predator, The Hunt for the Most Meticulous Serial Killer of the 21st Century by Maureen Callahan. This is about serial killer Israel Keys. Israel Keys probably was the person that had the highest body count um, in terms of serial killers in the 21st century in America, and he it was only definitively connected to four victims, even though um, experts speculate that there were probably hundreds. Um, so this was crazy to read about. This also was crazy to read about just because the way this case was handled was so terrible. Basically, law enforcement, um, it was one big ego trip for certain individuals fighting over jurisdiction to try him and to interview him and interrogate him when really they should have given it up to a higher authority. So a lot of this case was very frustrating with the way it was handled because Israel Keys ended up committing suicide. So unfortunately, even though they have a list of, you know, about 100 people that he probably did kill, um, they'll still never be able to recover the bodies of the victims or be able to definitively conclude that it was him because they didn't get the answers out of him because he really ran the show when he got arrested. Um, he was an egomaniac and just, whew. It was, it was tough to read. It was interesting to read. Um, if you're a fan of true crime, I would recommend this, but it was definitely crazy to read about because I think a lot of people, me included, feel like it's a lot harder to be a serial killer um, in modern days before, you know, forensics and the feds and just it's harder to commit murder which is a good thing. At least you would think. So that's why, you know, we don't hear about as many Ted Bundy's or John Wayne Gacy's or people like that, but this kind of makes you think he got away with it for a really, really, really long time. And with so many victims, um, how many more people like this are out there? It's a bizarre read. It's a good read. Um, I would only recommend this though. Um, if you are really into true crime or have like a strong stomach because a lot of graphic graphic things do get talked about in here. The next book that I read in the month of February was Rosemary's Baby by Ira Levin. This is a reread for me. Um, and I'd have to say that it held up just as good as the first time I read it. This is one of the classic horror books that most terrifies me. Um, and it doesn't have to do with like any of the Satanism or any of like that <laughs> sort of thing. But this is a book about a woman named Rosemary and her and her husband move into this really luxurious apartment building. Their neighbors seem really nice. Everything seems really great. They decide to try and start a family. But as soon as Rosemary becomes pregnant, she starts to feel like something is very, very wrong. It is a little bit dated. There are some things in there that are a product of its time. Like there's one Asian person in there and I think he's just referenced solely as the China man um, and just like some small things like that that are a little off-putting for a modern reader um, but it was written a while ago so we kind of have to take it as a product of his time but this book is so scary because it's it really has to do um, I mean it is a horror about like there are some satanic things going on in there. Um, I feel like this is kind of a classic so everyone knows a little bit about what it's about but I think the scariest parts are Rosemary and how helpless that she is. Um, everyone is basically gaslighting her and it's just so scary the loss of urgency that she has and like the loss of her autonomy about her and her body and her baby. She's very dependent on her husband. She doesn't have a job. Um, and he's starting to become more and more controlling um, in terms of who she can hang out with and these neighbors. Um, she doesn't want around her and her baby and it's just, I think that's the scariest thing is a woman's loss of agency and just obviously magnified a little bit because it's horror but that was the scariest part to me is, you know, no one believes her. She is all alone in this world even when she tries to, slight spoilers here, when she tries to run and get help um, from different people they just believe her husband um, and they believe these other male characters in her life just because they're male and she's seen as a hysterical woman and it's just, it's a hard book. It's a scary book. It's a genuinely scary book. This definitely holds up as a horrifying book. Um, I don't know if I'm going to read um, Son of Rosemary or I know there were a couple other ones in this series I believe that I don't think are as good so I might just keep Rosemary's Baby as a standalone. It really holds up and it is a really good 
audiobook as well. Um, Mia Farrow, the actress who plays Rosemary in the original um, Rosemary's Baby movie, actually voices the whole audiobook, so that's really cool. The next book I read was for Thrillerathon, and that was The Death of Mrs. Westaway by Ruth Ware. I really enjoyed this one. This is my second Ruth Ware book, and she is now like an auto buy author for me or someone that I'm going to pick up every single release that she has because I really enjoy her thrillers. They're very solid. At first glance, I'd say almost a lot of them kind of seem like stereotypical, especially the older ones. I feel like seem like stereotypical um, domestic thrillers, but both of her books I've kind of picked up when I was feeling a little bit slumpy and I read through them so fast. So I think there is definitely merit in that. This one is about a woman named Harriet Westaway. She receives a letter from her grandma mother's estate saying that her grandmother has died and to come collect her inheritance. However, she knows this to be wrong. All of Harriet's grandparents have already passed. She's not related to this woman, but she is in a really sticky situation. Um, there are loan sharks after her. Her mother died and has left her in a lot of debt because of her death. And Harriet's just really struggling to make ends meet. So she thinks maybe she can kind of Robin Hood this family out of some money because she's really hard pressed for cash and she goes to this estate and kind of realizes things within the family are not all what they seem and there actually might be a connection um, to her and her mother in this family that she didn't know about. This is very good. I feel like if you read a lot of thrillers, large parts of this might be predictable. I kind of predicted it, but not in a bad way. It was a very good conclusion to this book um, and it definitely had, it was definitely fast paced and kept me reading. I finished this in a day. So this is definitely a page turner. It might be, it might not be the most like out of left field plot twists, but personally I don't really need those in a thriller. I would rather really excellent writing and really believable endings. Um, and maybe sacrifice some of the crazy plot twists that no one sees coming, especially if the plot twists that no one sees coming um, kind of cheapen the book. So if you don't mind maybe guessing the ending to a thriller, this is a really good thriller. The next book I read was also for Thrillerathon, and that was Recursion by Blake Crouch. This one is about a New York policeman, and I forget his name, um, Barry Sutton, and he is researching a false memory syndrome. That's all you should know going into it. There is a new epidemic of people believing that they had led different lives than what they led and both of the timelines in their heads feel equally real to them. Um, it's been dubbed false memory syndrome and he's investigating it and there's a lot to do. It's very similar to his last book, Dark Matter, in terms of realistic time travel and different um, realities. If you're looking for a pretty decent sci-fi thriller, this is it. I will say I definitely agree. Parts of this almost felt like he had some of these ideas when writing Dark Matter and couldn't figure out how to put them in, so then just wrote another book about it. So it is very similar, but I feel like Blake Crouch has a very easy writing style that's easy to get into, and there are a lot of big big picture ideas being written about in here that I think he does in a very clear and concise way that's pretty easy to pick up, especially if you are new to um, some of like the scientific concepts that are talked about in here. The next book I read, I got this for book of the month and I had heard nothing about it um, except it was offered as an add-on, so I went ahead and added it on, and that was Ink in the Blood by Kim Smijal. It's about two young women named Celia and Anya, and they are Inklings, so in this world, the main religion, they have Inklings who tattoo themselves, and those tattoos appear on someone else to give them a sign from the divine. This is kind of a corrupt system, so when a traveling theater troupe comes comes to town, Anya and Celia escape with them, running away from this corrupt system until they realize that the divine is very, very real, and she is not as benevolent as people think, and she is after them because they are trying to expose her religion as a fraud. This is a young adult debut from this author. Um, this definitely has a lot of Venice sort of dark plague-ish vibes, and I loved how inclusive this was without feeling like it was written just to kind of check off boxes on a list. This is a world where non-binary is very much a part of vernacular. You know, people just exist in terms of pronouns. There's an aura around each person, whether they want to be called by he, him, she, her, or they, them. And 
um, it's just a world without homophobia and a world without kind of prejudice for people on the LGBTQIA plus spectrum. So that was pretty cool to read about. I will say this is apparently the first in a series. I thought it wrapped up very nicely as a single book. I'm not really sure going on what else is going to be in there if it's going to be just a part just the world in general being built up even more and more stories within the world or if it'll be the same plot because again i felt like this is a good standalone the next book that i read this month was girls with sharp sticks by suzanne young this is a thriller ya dystopian about an academy where a group of girls are essentially being raised to be stepford wives and one of the girls starts to kind of piece things together that this is not what's happening in the rest of the world and this is not what she wants out of her life or her friends want out of their lives and they're trying to figure out the kind of deeper secrets behind the school because it's not only a school there are bigger things at play um and I really enjoyed this. This is my first Suzanne Young book. I know she's written a bunch of like YA dystopian sort of books like this um and I think the second book is being released in March so I'm very excited to pick it up. I read this one on audio as well and I thought the narrator did a really good job. I've really been trying to pick up audiobooks more just because um, if I don't listen to audiobooks I just haven't been reading because I don't really have the free time as much as I used to and also audiobooks are really nice for... Um, I've been doing a lot of gaming <laughs> this month as well and I'm definitely gonna be doing a lot of gaming in the month of March because I mean it's March right now as I'm filling this and Pokemon Mystery Dungeon came out so that was my jam when it came out in sixth grade. Um, I just have so many memories of that game. It really came for me in a pivotal point in my life um, or I just needed like a fun little escape game. I played it all the time and it got really released for the Switch and just like updated the graphics and added some more features and it is wonderful and a wonderful part about that game is you can take breaks between the main story and just do like mindless little quests so audiobooks that's a great time. Also Pokemon Sword um, when you're just running around the wild area leveling up Pokemon audiobooks for that is great and of course <laughs> I've already pre-ordered Animal Crossing come March 20th, so audiobooks are my friend, so I'm really trying to figure out which narrators I like and what kind of audiobooks I like, and I had picked this up because the audio I was looking through audiobook narrators that I had already listened to and loved, and this audiobook narrator I would already listened to, so I decided to pick this book out. It isn't something that I normally read, but it was really good, so I highly recommend it. My sister picked it up as well and really enjoyed it, and she tends to read more YA contemporary than I do. I definitely tend to read more adult and horror sci-fi fantasy, and this is like the perfect book for both of us. We both really enjoyed it. So I think this has pretty wide appeal and I'm really looking forward to the end of this book. Um, it's going to take the series in a completely different direction than the synopsis on this even has. So highly recommend you picking it up. And then the very last book that I read this month was From Here to Infinity by Caitlin Darty. She's written about three books now and they're all on Scribd as audiobooks. She narrates them, which I think is highly enjoyable. I picked this one up first because um, I've just been on a really big mythology kick lately. And this one, From Here to Infinity, she is going around the world and she is not only looking at the kind of industrialization of the burial system in the United States and how it takes money from people when they're the most vulnerable and how much capitalism has impacted how much a funeral costs and how much it costs to put a loved one to rest and she's looking at not only that but more green renewable sustainable practices for burial and cremation in the United States and abroad and then also lots of different cultures and the way that they put their dead to rest and it was really fascinating. I loved it. I wouldn't recommend it for everyone um, because it does go into depth about these burial practices and about decomposing corpses and it deals a lot with morality and um, one of the points that is raised in the book is how Americans as a whole, we shun it. We don't talk about death. We don't like talking about death in terms of it being the end and it being, you know, kind of a final last chapter. That's why we like preserving our dead, making them look like they're not dead. In terms of other cultures, you know, it's very, very different the way they perceive the end of life and the way they perceive dead bodies and the grossness surrounding them. It was 
really, really great. I highly recommend it. It's probably one of the best nonfiction books I've read in a while because Caitlin herself is just so funny. She's so passionate about these things and it was really, I really enjoyed reading about these different cultures and different burial practices and there was no tone of judgment. If I had to guess, I would say Caitlin herself is probably an atheist and I feel like in the past when I've read about different cultures and their burial practices and what they believe is sacred and what is not sacred, um, it's hard to read that without a western Christian lens on it, on that sort of thing. And it was really nice to read what, I mean, everything has biases, but it was nice to read someone who was just genuinely interested in learning about different cultures and just how we celebrate death and the end of life and our loved ones. So um, if you're interested in any of that, that was probably one of my favorite books that I read this month and it definitely came out of left field because I was actually looking for another one of her books and um, thought that one kind of aligned with my interests a little bit more, but I will be checking out her other books. She has two more also dealing with um, discussions of death and mortuary sort of things. So yeah, I'm gonna be looking into those as well. And that brings me to the end of this wrap up. Um, thanks for sticking with me. If you have, I know this has been a very long video. Um, kind of the downside of reading so much in a month comes with sitting down and making a review of all of them. But thank you if you've gotten to this point. Please, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up, subscribe for more content from me, leave a comment down below, and I will catch you guys in another video. Bye!